go. All right, we're set up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am Bridget Trosen with Washington Sea Grant. I work on a number of programs. Um, one of my programs is the King Tides program. And so we'll go ahead and talk a little bit about what we're doing here in Washington. So as a review, a king tide is a non-scientific word that is used to describe the highest tides of the year. And the highest tides of the year in our region occur during November, December, and January. So during our winter, during our darkest months, um, this is when we have a couple of scenarios that play out where it just increases our tides. And that happens when we have alignment between the sun, the moon, and the earth. Um, and when the moon is in closest orbit around the earth, that increases the gravitational pull on our oceans. So it creates kind of a bulge that pulls out and it creates that little bit of extra height in our tides. And the same thing with the sun, when we're in alignment with the sun, um, and also when we're in our closest alignment around the sun, which happens in January, that also increases the gravitational pull on our ocean's water and creates that scenario where we have a little bit of extra tug and um, creates that extra high tide. There are lots of factors that affect our total water level. So the most common things that you'll hear on the news will be like, oh, we're having a king tide. And it'll be like a storm rolling in. And you're like, no, that's low pressure system moving in <laughs> because that's the weather. Um, but um, there's just lots of things that affect our water level. So tide is but one singular thing that affect how we experience our coastal waters. Storms rolling in uh, that create that low pressure system on our oceans that also affects our total water level. Um, there's lots of different things. So um, right now we're talking about king tides. Okay. Sorry. Um, we use king tides in Washington to communicate sea level rise. So just a quick overview of um, the different uh, contributing factors that are adding in to our total sea level rise. Um, so we have thermal expansion, which is a big hefty 50% of that um, total sea level rise. We have our melting glaciers, especially in the Northwest here. Um, and we have ice sheets, which is another hefty 40%. Oops, go to the next one. There we go, okay. And in Washington, we have a couple of really cool um, new projects that have come out that really hone in on local sea level rise. So in 2018, we had this like multi-multi-partner NOAA-funded project that really looked at, hey, what is the actual sea level rise that we are going to experience in Olympia, Washington? And how does that compare to what we experience in Bellingham, Washington, or Fort over up in the Northwest Nia Bay or um, down in Southwest Washington? And so here, this is one of the outputs from that project. And, can you give me and, and you can see that there is this gradient on the right-hand side, um, which shows that the in Puget Sound, particularly the, particularly the southern part of Puget Sound, we're experiencing a little bit more sea level rise than we are, for example, up in the northwest corner of the state up by Nia Bay. And that is because we have, um, our land is moving all the time, right? We live in a really ge geologically active area. We have volcanoes, we have likelihood for earthquakes. Um, we have a subduction zone off of our coast. And as those plates are pushing against each other, uh, we are being either uplifted or we are creating buckles in the actual earth that we are standing on. And all of that affects whether or not the land that we are living on is sinking or subsiding, or whether that land is being uplifted or being pushed up. Um, and so these localized sea level rise projections take all of that extra information into account. And it's one thing that makes them 
um, more accurate than say the NOAA sea level rise projections that have come out or some of the larger global sea level rise projections. So I'm gonna dive into just an example of that here. Um, we're looking at Port Townsend. Uh, these are the local, um, you can see this little dark blue navy line that's outlining that very specific part of the shoreline. And we're asking this model, what are the sea level, sea level rise projections for that specific area of Puget Sound? And so over on the right, you can see three uh, line graphs and they're showing sort of what we call um, the highest, uh, like a low medium high scenario. So uh, if you look at like the orange one, you'll have like a 50% chance of having um, two feet of sea level rise by 2090. And in the same year, you, you also will have a 50% um, chance or a 1% chance of having four feet of sea level rise. And so if we take that, the, that scenario, the two feet of sea level rise, and we Put, plug that into the NOAA sea level rise viewer, we can see what areas of shoreline in Port Townsend are most likely to flood. And typically, those areas are the most likely to flood in any high water scenario, including king tides. So it's really neat when we are able to talk about the sea level rise projections, uh, show them on a map with the NOAA sea level rise viewer, and then also link those up with the high water event photos from our King Tides program. And so this is a picture of the Maritime Center in Port Townsend during a King Tide. And these are submitted by some sort of rock star volunteers that we have up there um, that take pictures every single King Tides event. And they have been doing that for over seven years at this point. So now I'm gonna dive a little bit into the photograph part, which is kind of the like, let's get people involved part that I get really excited about. Um, and here on the uh, Sea Grant website, we have a King Tides calendar. So if you were to scroll down or go to this and scroll down, you'll see all of the different predicted tides, the highest predicted tides for these locations on the map. So we have Bellingham, Port Townsend, Seattle, Olympia, um, Dungeness, La Push, Shelton, Westport, South Bend, and Owaco. And we have all of the different um, dates and times and the predicted highest tide for those locations. And one thing I'll point out that is a little bit different than, than in Oregon, just because of the, the geography in Washington, is that king tides happen on different days and different times than they do on the coastal part of Washington state. So there tends to be this trend where um, king tides will happen ar around middle of the day between like 11 and one o'clock on our coast. And in Puget Sound, the king tides are always in the early morning. So they'll be anywhere from like 5 a.m. to around like eight o'clock a.m. And here, uh, this is the website that we use for uh, submitting all of our King Tides photos. So we ask people from around the coast to go ahead and submit their King Tides photos. We use the My Coast app. It's a really cool app. It, you just go and download it on your phone and it's free. It will show you like where you are for that day, like in the tide, which is actually what I like to use it for, like on a daily basis, even if I'm not um, taking photos of a king tide. And then you go ahead and you submit it. And the great thing about the app is that it pulls all of the metadata and attaches it to that photo. So the date, the time, uh, the location, the nearest, uh, tide gauge information will all be linked to that photo that you submit. And it's viewable. So you can go to the website and you can look at all of the other photos that have been submitted. So I'm gonna go ahead um, and just show you a little bit of the MyCoast uh, website here. 
So this is where you would go. You would go to the King Tides. There's several other volunteer programs that are part of the My Coast. So just making sure that you're selecting the King Tide option. It's the little crown icon. And it'll take you to the Washington King Tides photos. If you wanted to click in, let's say you're really interested in all the photos are up in Bellingham, then you would zoom in on the map um, and click on the little crown icons. Whoops. Uh, and like, like right here, you would be able to click in on that and you could see all of the uh, photos that are available from um, that specific location. So I think that's it. And then I, I'll talk a little bit about some other cool work that we're doing at the end. And Miley, I may ask you to jump in. Jesse. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Bridget. It's been so great to learn about uh, what Washington is doing. Um, I've been working on the Oregon King Tides project since I started with Coast Watch about three years ago or so. So um, yeah, so we're going to talk about Oregon for a few minutes now. Um, the Oregon King Tides Project, uh, like Washington, um, wants volunteers to document the highest of the high tides to see where water is potentially having damaging effects. And this helps partners like the Oregon Coast Management Program um, and coastal community leaders capture potential impacts of sea level rise now and into the future. Uh, next slide. Um, so is this the second one? Did I miss one? Is this? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, so the use of the term King Tide, because I don't think that Bridget talked about this, um, I originated in, in Australia, New Zealand, and other Pacific nations to refer to an especially high tide that occurs only a few times a year. Um, so king tides are a naturally occurring phenomenon. Um, and of course, we do have many high tides uh, throughout the year. Uh, they happen in the summertime as well. Um, in the winter time, we tend to get even higher high tides because of storm surges and water flowing down the rivers. Next slide. So this is an example of um, what it what it looks like uh, when you're zooming in to um, the Oregon King Tides Project website, which we'll look at a little bit a little bit more further on. One of the things that we are, have been focusing on are uh, comparison photos. So here we have a comparison photo of the Salmon River Estuary um, in Otis, Oregon. Um, and what we're asking folks to do year round is they can take a picture of a regular high tide event at any time of the year so that we can have those comparison photos. So what we're seeing here on the top is we're seeing a, um, a regular high tide photo and then a, a king tide photo on, on the bottom. And so this is a bit of, um, of a focus for this project every year. Um, and this allows us to do education all year long um, to try to capture uh, these comparison photos any time of the year to kind of fill in the gaps. So people that are participating in this project can go to the website, look to see where there are no comparison photos, and then uh, go out into the communities and take those photos to fill in those gaps. Okay, next slide. So again, a little bit about the history. Um, this began, um, so we think about it as like an international project in 2008 and 2009. Um, Oregon King Tides Project uh, began in Oregon in 2010 and 11 and is a partnership between Coast Watch, which is the program that I work for and coordinate, and the Oregon Coast Management Program. Um, the Oregon Coast Management Program uh, created the website and they manage the website. And then King uh, or the Coast Watch Program, um, myself, 
And we provide all of the outreach, doing a number of events all year long along the entire coast, both, both in person and online um, to uh, engage and uh, recruit volunteers, um, including um, individuals, groups, and schools um, in this project. Next slide. So in Oregon, um, the king tides this season are, uh, uh, they were November 24th through the 26th, uh, December 22nd through the 24th, and January 20th through the 22nd. Now in October, we had quite a storm event and some very, very high tides. Um, and uh, sometimes we actually do like a bonus series in, um, in February. And as we educate during this time, we talk about how these high tides and these storm surges can happen at any time of the year. Um, the photo project uh, just uh, focuses on the highest of the high tides during this season. But again, we ask volunteers to participate all year long by submitting those uh, comparison photos of the regular and average high tides. And this is a photo from the photo project. I didn't, I didn't include too many of those because you, you can all go to the website. But this is, um, I think this was taken in 2019, actually. And these are what, uh, what we're looking for um, in terms of information, like where it was, what time it was shot, whether they were looking north or south. Uh, next slide. So this is actually uh, one of, we have a traveling exhibit um, that, really should have gotten off the ground in 2020. Um, and we have three vinyl banners uh, with grommets and they are these wonderful, like they're large, maybe three feet uh, long by one and a half feet tall. And these, this is a, just an example of one of them that really shows uh, why uh, this project is important. Um, and these I've noticed when I take these to communities really resonate with the community leaders. Um, so the Oregon Coast Management Program works with uh, community leaders. They work with the state, they work with the Oregon Coastal Atlas um, and they have a plan for sea level rise in numerous communities. I think there are about 22 communities now that have um, some of the information that Bridget was talking about. And it's not uh, mandated or, or uh, regulated that this happens in communities, but um, if community leaders would like to participate, um, they may reach out to the Oregon Coastal Management um, and work on planning their, their communities. So this is just an example here of um, of what these photos actually provide. They give information that then creates uh, mapping and mapping points to really show the impact of, uh, of the flooding in the communities. Okay, next slide. So here is uh, a little piece from the website and we'll just go through these um, pretty quickly. Um, so, Oregon King Tides, I think it's OregonKingTides.net is the website. And the dots that you see on the left, um, you can click on them. So very similar to the Washington Project. Um, and go to the next slide, Bridget. Um, and then you can see here, um, so I think I had clicked in on Pacific City here. Um, I clicked on a, on a, on a point. And this survey uh, information comes up. So this is the information that the photographer put into um, the image. It, uh, you can see that the description is here. And you can see that um, the photo is an average high tide. So this is an average high tide, not a king tide. And if you go to the next slide, um, this, is what it, this is what it shows. And so 
This, these photos are only available in this way during the current season. Um, past seasons are available in a connected Flickr account on this site. So we have a rather large uh, Flickr account and that's where all of the photos really are kept because there's not enough room on the actual website um, because we have a lot of photos like Washington every year, we're getting more and more photos. Um, but the current years are available so participants can go in there and see what has happened. So this photo, as you can see, was just taken um, in November, the week before the King Tides happened. Uh, next slide. And so here is some information from the Oregon Coastal Atlas, so similar to what Bridget was talking about. Um, and here we see Seaside, Oregon. So on the left, um, just a map without the layers. And on the right, uh, you can see the uh, affected uh, projected flooding um, that will happen in that community. So you can see here, you can't see actually my cursor, but um, this is one of a number of communities. I think there are a total, I counted them earlier, 28 communities actually in Oregon that have been uh, mapped um, for sea level rise. And so you can click into these communities uh, all along the coast of Oregon from seaside all the way down to Gold, Gold Beach. And um, anyone, I uh, can just get in here and actually and actually see where these flooded projections are. And um, just to reiterate, uh, the King Tides project, all these photo projects actually help um, to determine where this flooding is going to be. So something that I learned a couple of years ago that I like to repeat is that the King Tides today are the high tides of tomorrow. They're the high tides of the future. Um, and so here, not all of these were created by photo points, but the goal is to actually, you know, connect the photo points with the mapping, like was in uh, that one of the previous slides with um, the traveling exhibit where it shows. Uh, okay, next slide. feel like some of my slides didn't make it in there. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say <laughs> was that we uh, incentivize volunteers uh, by having a contest. Um, and so we partnered with the Oregon Coast Visitors Association uh, to provide um, prizes for uh, the different like uh, photos that are available. So like, uh, flooding in communities, erosion comparison photos. And so that really helps to increase the amount of participants that we that we have. Okay, thanks for forwarding the slides, Bridget. Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, Miley, if you wanna go ahead and jump in here at any point too. Since you guys are all educators, I figured it would be relevant uh, to mention that um, I know that at the NAME conference, which I wasn't able to attend um, this past August, but two of my colleagues did. Um, it was Nicole Narr and Anita Ray, and uh, they were able to present on our draft. I think it was day two of this high school curriculum and run through that with maybe some of you if you ended up attending that session. So I thought it would be nice to report back that we had, we're really thankful for the, um, the information that you provided and the feedback that you gave us. And we were able to integrate that into our curriculum and finish it, which was, you know, a pretty amazing task um, that we've been working on for about a year. And we're testing that in three pilot schools in Washington for this King Tide season. And we're hoping to get more feedback from uh, those uh, teachers that are actually implementing it in the classroom. Uh, and I just wanna kind of put a plug out there too, if there's any uh, high school teachers that are on here or know of any in Washington that are interested in giving it a pilot, you know, or really um, that they're more than welcome to reach out to Miley or me, um, and, and we would love to, to hook you up with our curriculum. 
So basically, we have a couple of um, things that I was just going to run through it. The main reason that we created the curriculum was to engage a totally different demographic. A lot of the people that participate in the King Tides program currently tend to be uh, retired people or people who are just like super enthusiastic about all things ocean. And I really wanted to engage a younger group of Washingtonians in the King Tides program. And this was one way to do that. Uh, I also wanted to let that specific demographic, our younger uh, generation know about all of the pre-existing tools that we have in Washington around our sea level rise uh, projections that we have for Washington and um, how, to, how to use that and how to understand that and engage with that data. And the thing that sets us apart from other title curriculums that exist around the country is that it's Washington specific. It's using Washington photos, Washington sea level rise projections, and it's geared towards Washington. So um, that's what makes it kind of stand out and unique and applicable. Is there anything else, Miley, that you would add? Yeah, thanks, Bridget. Um, no, I think you covered most of it. I think, uh, yeah, Bridget put some details up here, but um, we decided to focus on doing sort of a three-day curriculum based on feedback we got from teachers, um, like how long they could actually focus on something like this. Um, and then we really tried to pull from the standards like so that we could justify, we could have them justify teaching it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really interesting and fun. And I feel like I learned so much in the process. Um, <clears throat> and what I'm really interested to learn more, um, from Jesse and, and just get feedback from others is, you know, that this ends up being like a really, you know, um, in the classroom focused curriculum, um, they're using, you know, technology to do a lot of it because they're having to access websites and whatnot. And we wanted sort of the field component to be this extra, if you can get out and take pictures and, and do that yourself to be sort of the community science-based part of it. Um, but also because I'm an, an informal educator, sort of the next step in my brain is how to then use this um, and like adapt it to more of an informal audience. So like, what could we do to use some of the things that we did in this curriculum? And also curious to know what Jesse works on um, with her audiences and like how you can use this in, in a more informal setting. So, you know, one step at a time, but it's been really fun to, to work with Bridget on this um, and our other colleagues. So thank you. And that's it. I think that's the end, right? Awesome. I think Jessica, so. Do you want to add anything at the end before we take questions? I think it's a I think it's a great time to just uh, start having a discussion now and, and take questions. Um, I will. I got a question from uh, Janice, so I'll just start there and then we can move on. Um, she said, "So more of the mouth of the Columbia River rather than tributaries." Janice was asking about: Are there photos from uh, Lewis and Clark River? Um, and Young's Bay. And I said that, yes, we're focusing more on tidal rivers, bays, and estuaries this year, which is really, well, last year we really, really started to, and we got a lot of photos. It's interesting with the mouth of the Columbia, it's so jettied, right? And um, there are a lot of islands in the Columbia River. Um, and so the photos that would come in would really just be like these big waves on the jetties or like high water around the jetties. Um, and so it's the bays like Baker Bay in Washington actually. And um, and yes, bridge, yeah. So there are some photos that came in from, from the bridge, definitely. Um, but what we're really seeing with the mouth of the Columbia where you can really see the waters rise and the impacts of the flooding are in uh, Young's Bay along the, um, the Highway 101 uh, bridge there, um, which is the bridge that goes uh, from Warrington to Astoria. The Megler Bridge is so, so high that um, it's, a, it's kind of hard to see, but, but those photos are definitely starting to come in. Um, yes, Lewis and Clark National Historic Park is, is participating and they have taken some awesome photos over the last few years of their restoration projects um, 
on their properties there. And so I love, it's great to have somebody that knows the Oregon uh, landscape, Janice. It's, I love, I'm loving your questions. So yeah, so a lot of uh, punch out the dike projects, for example, that happened here, like salmon restoration projects that happened in the lower Columbia, um, Lewis and Clark National Historic Park, uh, taking photos every year and submitting them of their projects there. So, yeah. Other questions for Bridget and Jesse or comments? And go ahead. I can't see everybody because my view is messed up. So just feel free to jump in. There we go. <clears throat> And Miley, you yourself wanted had a, some questions. We could talk about those. Yeah, I mean, I am. Um, well, and actually, Janice, that's a great sort of segue, sort of how we can tie this into sort of inland areas. So one of the things that we worked on with the curriculum um, for the Washington program um, was trying to, it, this wasn't necessarily inland per se, but like trying to give, students um ways to connect with their own communities and like plug in their own communities and so obviously that still needs to sort of be near water but um so for for students who didn't have access to that water we would give them like example places that they could try so they could see it um, but then sort of challenge them to think about um making comparisons between like infrastructure that might be impacted in that community that might be similar to the communities that they lived in um, and I think we could probably like if we we had a lot of sort of extension ideas around around that, um, because right like how do you make it relevant for people who are not like seeing this sort of day to day. Um, and so, so we definitely thought a lot about that, but I, I am curious to know sort of how. Um, you know, Jesse, how are you all working with, with youth? Are you working with youth in this capacity at all? Um, or are there goals to, and, and sort of what that looks like um, for Oregon? So that is new just in the last, so I started with Coast Watch in late 2019. Um, and at that time, there wasn't an effort yet to um, engage with the schools. Um, but we've been working hard to engage them. We don't have a curriculum yet. So I'm, I really wanna talk more about that like at another time. Um, and I was excited to learn about that from Bridget and to hear a little bit more about that tonight. What did start to happen was schools um, were just interested in engaging. The teachers were interested in engaging even without a curriculum, which was exciting because it was something to do. So we have something called the Coast Watch in the Schools program. So Coast Watch is a mile by mile beach adoption program. And um, anyone can adopt a mile, including schools. Um, and then once they adopt a mile, which is just this basic observation, it's not a, a protocol. I introduced them then to uh, citizen science and community science projects. And this is one of them that at all at that everyone can can that uh, everyone can be a part of like for example um not every coastal school is near a rocky habitat so they couldn't do like sea star surveys for example but everyone can do um the king tide monitoring king tide photo project so we don't have at this time a curriculum um, but it is one of the options. And so we have had schools just engage in this um, uh, near their schools um, and supply some photos, which has been really exciting. So they're they're into it as being part of a, of a project, being part of a citizen science and community science project, um, even without the curriculum. But I think that the curriculum could really help to... Um, uh, make it even more interesting and um, maybe wholesome for the for the teacher and this and the school districts so that we'd love to see that happen. That's awesome. That, I, that's really interesting to me because I think about, you know, when we were designing this, we wanted to make it sort of packageable so that the teachers could get through the whole thing. But I think I oftentimes think about as an informal educator, like I might just want like one chunk that I can take and do, you know, in a you know, half an hour, like demo or something like that, or, 
I, what you bring into like, you know, bringing it as an option in another, in an otherwise existing sort of other program, like having sort of a, a chunk that we could give to a group like yours in Washington would be an interesting thing to consider. Um, because I think what's, what's cool about ours is that it's like really formulated for the classroom, but you can never beat the like experience of being in the field when you have folks. I mean, that's what Bridget started with, right? Like, is that you're outside with a group of <clears throat> folks and, and talking about tides as they're like looking at the, mm -hmm. looking at tides, right? So like, you can't, you can't really replace that experience. So like having some things that you could work with like in the field. Um, so I, I like thinking about that. Yeah, and I'm an informal educator too. Um, so I love meeting other informal educators and I love learning from formal educators. And what I love about the King Tides project is there's there's so many different ways that you could go with this. I mean, a lot of uh, you know, there's so many opportunities just with learning about the tides themselves, right? That's that's there, and that's something that you can learn in the classroom. Um, so as long as we're, you know, pushing safety, 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 uh, we want that outside experience to happen as well. Um, and I love looking at your like three day curriculum. I like the idea of thinking about, well, what if we did like two days and then the third day was out in the field, if that could happen. One of the things that Oregon Shores has been working toward in the last year has actually been getting funding after learning that some of the gaps with getting kids to the beach was transportation, one, money for transportation, and two, having experts on the beach. Those are the two main things. And so we've been working with that. So we are actually, we have a small pot of money that we're actually offering um, Oregon schools to just get a bust of kids to the beach. Um, what's always been so surprising to me is that we have all these coastal schools and how a lot of them don't get to the beach. <laughs> it's like, you know, but sometimes that last step is so hard, you know, it's like, you don't have boots, you can't cross the, the pond or whatever. So you have to have a bus to get you there or, or you know, some kind of transportation. Um, so as long as we're pushing safety, it's great to get the kids out there with their cell phones and take the photos. Yeah. And I appreciate that, <clears throat> that layer of risk management that needs to be like <laughs> blanketed throughout, right? Like this is like the highest risk time to be around the water probably. So uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, I'd love to chat. I'd love to chat more offline. We have another question um, from Michelle. Um, we plan to be in Rockaway Beach, Oregon during the January King tides. Should oh. we expect any flooding? Oh my gosh. Okay. Rockaway is like the poster child for Oregon. <laughs> it is the one that gets the most dramatic photographs and most dramatic videos. Um, I absolutely be careful. If I were you, I would look at previous years and the addresses where the flooding is going to happen. And this is what I love about the King Tides projects. People can go into it, then go into these maps for these for, you know, regardless of whether or not they're going to be even participating in this, it's such a great learning tool, right? So you can go in, you can look at previous years, you can look at the maps and see where the photos have been taken. You can see exactly what has happened on specific days of the year with photography. It's fascinating. Rockaway has pushed the limits with their development. I mean, it's incredible. And they're always in the courts uh, with, you know, Surfrider, Oregon Shores, uh, Department of Land Conservation and Development. So it's a very interesting, exciting place to be during the King Tide season. Um, would love to see your photos. If you're going there, I would love uh, you to look at, um, you know, like I said, where photographs have been taken. And then if you are there during an average high tide, uh, take a photo of that location and add that to the to to the project. But yeah, Rockaway is a hot spot. It's the hottest spot on the Oregon coast for the King Tides project. <laughs> You're welcome, Michelle. <clears throat> Other questions or comments? Yeah, this is Kathy from Hi, Victoria. Kathy. I was just wondering, is there any similar kind of thing being developed on this side of the border? Do you know? Okay. Does anybody know? I'm not aware of any. Yeah, I'm not aware of any uh, right now. Yeah, 
if you know of any, or if you come across any, let me know. Cause I'd love to partner with them. I'm just, I mean, I'm in Bellingham. So it's right. like, you know, well, just going to jump. Yeah. So. <laughs> and it strikes me that for teachers here, it would be even just going to, to those sites and looking could, could be a, a nice template for applying it to, mm -hmm. to our coast too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I haven't heard anything in Canada yeah. yet either, but um, I'm going to check and see because that's wonderful what you guys are doing. And it's great too to be, you know, getting it both into the classrooms and informal settings. Jen, it looks like Jen just posted something in the in the chat. Jen, did you have a chance to dig into that at all? Um, yeah, no, I just did a basic search and I found a Canadian Geographic article, but nobody like I looked for DFO and to see if they were doing anything on that. Um, and just, you know, my five second search, which was super deep, um, <laughs> didn't come up with anything. <laughs> I, I do. But I found that interesting article on Canadian Geographic. So I thought that might be a good jumping off point. <laughs> I know. And I'm not sure who it is, if it's a CRD or what, our regional district. Every year they do ask for people to go out to places near, the, you know, on the shoreline in Victoria and to take mm -hmm. pictures on that day. But I don't know sort of what's being done with it. Mm -hmm. But this connection with, with schools and, and other groups is, is wonderful. And citizen science. I yeah. feel like there's also like a STEAM opportunity here in terms of like, with so much cool photography, like what could we do with so many pictures, you know? It might be a good thing to do at the NMEA conference is have a youth component of, of photographs of King Tides. Mm. Oh, that's a good idea for the student conference. Yeah. I was yeah. also thinking that that could be like a cool collaborative effort across, you know, Oregon, Washington, BC, if we can connect with whomever is in charge yeah. of that, even Alaska, um, you know, submitting photos and like what we could do some sort of collage that, I don't know. I'm just, yeah, I'm not an artist, but I'm just thinking that <clears throat> utilizing like the database that we already have, the databases that we already have. And, yeah. um, well, and some of those photos that you showed were just amazing, just beautiful. Yeah, they're really, and just such a yeah. powerful tool, you know, yeah. it's such a neat, a neat tool to sort of explain the phenomenon. That's so um, when it comes to uh, curriculum resources, um, one place to take a look is Pacific Education Institute. Um, they're uh, solutions-oriented storylines. They have one set of resources on um, on coastal hazards. Yeah. So got some um, stuff there. That's great. That's great um, advice. We actually taught. We worked a little bit, or we were in touch with um, with PEI when we were trying to figure out if we were going to try and develop this or if we were going to try and partner with an organization to develop it. And so <clears throat> Tressa Arbo, who was one of the mm -hmm. ones working on that, um, was super helpful in, she actually used to work at Sea Grant. So um, there's some, you know, <laughs> easy partnership there, but, um, but yeah, she was helpful in providing us sort of what had already been done there. Um, and so, you know, we're hopeful that once we sort of get some feedback on what we have in our curriculum that we can um, sort of circle back with them and see like how we can sort of cross promote. Um, both of the, both of I've um, just started uh, in a half time position with PEI as their coastal field STEM coordinator. So. Oh, great. Okay. So are you based on the coast, John? I live in Forks. Oh, great. Okay. Oh, cool. That's, that's really great. cool, John. That's great to know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, and Tressa's, Tressa's still out on mat leave, I think. Yeah. Yeah. She is. Um, anyway, so yeah, well, John, let's connect because I, there's lots of other things we should connect on as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that, I love, I love knowing that you're out there. That's great. Okay. And a uh, PEI is new to me. Is that just Washington oriented or? Uh, yes, that... it's Washington okay. oriented. Okay. No, it's a province in Canada. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, is that too? <laughs> when you first said PEI, I was thinking, what the hell are they doing working with PEI on this? <laughs> <laughs> Wrong coast, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh man, that's awesome. Um, it's a really, Jesse, take a look at their website though. I mean, John can say more, but it's a really great, interesting model. Like it's very cool. Okay, I definitely will. I'm excited about that. 
I was thinking when we were talking a minute ago about about STEM and about STEAM, how um, what a neat project, an art project it would be to do like a stop motion uh, animation of the flooding uh, and on a map you know, or in a community or something. You could have a really cool art project with students there uh, to uh, show what flooding can do with, with stop motion. I, I, I love stop motion and kids love it too. So yeah. I don't know if there are teachers out there, but that would be a fun thing to do. Well, and then that would be so neat. I was also thinking like, how can you get this kind of thing into, you know, sort of museum spaces without it being sort of a, sta a static thing? I mean, you could use a lot of the pictures for it, but like, that would be such a cool tool to like a video to sh like have showing something that students had done. And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. interesting. I mean, anyway, we, we can do some colluding here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take on more projects that we don't have time to do. <laughs> No, we just make the students do them. See, the we students just, do them. right. Get exactly. the ideas out there, and then you know others can do it. <laughs> um, any, we have a couple more minutes before we need to sign off. Any um, last minute questions or thoughts? I have an old man question. Do it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I will preface this by saying I've been out of the classroom for twenty plus years, but I've worked with, as you know, uh, Ocean Science Bowl and with the Oregon Coast Aquarium. My problem with this whole thing is that nobody has ever defined exactly what a king tide is. And we get local newspapers that show pictures of big waves breaking on the coast, which is not a king tide. And what I would love to see is somebody somewhere taking the time, because I've graphed tides with kids for you know i came out of the classroom in 2000 and for 30 years ahead of that i graphed year-long tides with kids and we always had these kinds of tides i don't see any significant difference in the tide tables now than they were in the 1970s so if somebody would get out there and show us that there is in fact an increase in the height of the so-called king tides, and I only believe there's one or two of those a year, not quite as many as we predict, but that's another whole story. I haven't got time for it right now, but I'd love to see whether or not there's evidence that shows, yeah, uh, thermal changes in the ocean or whatever. I mean, it can be plate tectonics, tide anywhere you want to. I'd love to see evidence that these things are really having an effect. So there you go. That's your old man question for the day. Get out there and find me evidence. Well, it sounds like you're talking about sea level rise um, as well as part of this. And, you know, that and king tides are a predictor of sea level rise. Um, I don't know, Bridget, do you want to add anything to the question? Yeah. I, I think I'll just point out that, that you're absolutely right, that there isn't a difference in the tides themselves at all since there was in the 1970s. What has changed is the total water level. And so there's those are two different definitions. So in one, we're talking about the tidal influence where it specifically is that gravitational pull that is coming from the moon and the sun. And in the other piece of it, when we're talking about sea level rise, we're talking about uh, the increased temperature of the water that is creating an expansion of the water through thermal expansion. And then also the melting of our glaciers that is just adding water to our oceans and the Antarctic ice sheets that are melting that are adding water. So all of that is adding to our total water level um, whereas the tide, the king tide that we're talking about is just the influence from that gravitational pull between the moon and the sun. So I think, I think you're right that in the media, they tend to talk a lot about storms. <laughs> they tend to talk a lot about um, 
storms coming in, go take pictures of the king tides, which is a little bit confusing. It happens to be that in the Pacific Northwest, that our king tides occur during our stormiest months, right? So like, of course, we're going to have storms in November, December, and January. That's when we get our storms, right? And that's when we have our highest water levels. Um, but we also have our highest tides of the year during that, that time, even without any storm rolling through. Many, many of my photos or, you know, the photos that are in Washington are really boring because they are of king tides and there's no storm rolling through. It's just a, a simple flat photo photograph of a little bit higher portion of the steps that go down to a beach underwater. No big waves, no, none of those really dramatic photos that you can see when a storm is rolling through. I, don't know, I think you're doing the right, yeah, you're doing the right stuff. That's, that's the key, what's actually happening with the water it, minus the storms. And, and you're right, we do get, um, I think, misconceptions and we draw people to the coast and my major concern is we aren't doing a very good job of stressing the safety factor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody's going to come over and storm watch, but living on the Central Oregon coast, I'm aware of how many people get unfortunately washed away or whatever. So, you know, stress the safety, do the best you can. I don't know yeah. where to go from there. Yeah, and, and we do. We're, yeah, we're really stressing this. We're really stressing the safety every year more and more and more. It's a, it's a big part of our messaging, and Jean, you're it's you're right. Like it's interesting because of when I first started this, a lot of our photos that were coming in were just of these big waves at like Cape Arago. Right. And that's not what we want. That's not the point of these are these big, beautiful photographs, of big, beautiful waves. Right. We're looking at the inundation in the communities in those in those months. And what we have seen in the last three years, at least in Oregon, are less of the big wave photos splashing and more of like kind of what Bridget was talking about. Like they're a little bit boring. They're not super gorgeous photographs, but they really are showing the reach of the flooding into the communities. John, go ahead. Yeah, um, it, it sounds like a simple proposition, figure out where the zero level is and see if that's changing. But there are so many factors that are involved in where the water level actually is that it's it's uh, very much a moving target. And it's, it's a complicated measurement to make, which um, doesn't make good headlines. <laughs> Right, like in Oregon, um, you know, the, the king tide, the high high, the highest of the high tides um, happen in the winter, and it's known as like sunny day flooding. This is this term, the sunny day flooding. So in the summertime, um, there are, I mean, there are high highs, right? And they're happening at night. Um, and the low lows are happening during the day in the summertime. But in the winter time, we have these sunny day flooding, which is why we can we, why this project happens in the winter because it's bright out, it's sunny out, or it's whatever, it's cloudy out. We have daylight. We can go out and we can take photographs of these tides as they're happening. Now it's happening on the east coast more often than it's happening on the west coast, um, and we have these flooded roads here. Um, and a lot of people say, well, it's not really happening as much on the west coast, but what I find fascinating and I, what I want to know more about is that um, we, so we have less acceleration here on the West Coast than we do on the East Coast, but we have these tectonic plates that are happening here. And so Bridget talked a little bit about this too. And eventually um, we're going to catch up. That's what the Oregon Ma Coast Management Program calls it, like it's catching up of the of the flooding that is going to happen um so it's really interesting i don't know if i'll be alive to see that but i love thinking about and learning about this whole catching up and what's happening on the west coast with the tectonic plates and and the flooding so 
we could talk about this all night. It's interesting. <laughs> it looks like, Janice, did you have your question answered or did you want to chime in? Well, it kind, kind of. So do we not know is the, how do I put this? Sea level. Has sea level, the location of it, changed? Yes, it has so, changed. So a tide projection is from is based around sea level, not historical sea level. Is that would that be right? So as it rises, we may, may still see sea level that is you know two feet this way and two feet that way. But because it's higher, that the two feet in either direction is, well, the two feet higher is more extreme. Well, no, not really more extreme. It's just higher. farther inland. Yes. So <laughs> NOAA goes, um, every five years, NOAA will go through and reevaluate what the mean high, high water is, right? And so every five years, that gets adjusted. And that's the measurement that all of, the um, like contractors that go and like put marinas in, they're all based off of that mean high water. And, and NOAA is, goes through and adjusts that every five years. So, so what you're saying is a plus one tide today is higher in the, into the beach community than a plus one tide 10 years ago. Slightly, yes. Got it. Yeah, so it's kind of like the average air temperature over so many different years, they add it all up and you get an average. And as we move forward, that average changes. That's does, correct. Does no, Noah do? Oh. Well, I was just going to say, my understanding is that the tide charts and, and where zero occurs um, on your local tide charts is based on the mean lower low tide. In uh, it's, Probably so they don't run into you know, run ships into the beach or whatever, but um, that will be different for every place in the world. There's not a all over the place zero point uh, where you call that sea level or however you want to call it. And I'm glad to know that Noah's on top of it every five years. I think that's a misconception that the public has about what sea level means. And because it's kind of, um, I don't want to say subjective, it's kind of, uh, it moves based on the data that, and people really don't understand the what causes the tides having done astronomy for as many years people don't understand you know how the moon and how we're tied together and what that means um so how do we communicate better the what sea level is and how sea level has changed we talk about sea sea level um uh, the rise but risen from where well, well and the the other thing that's confusing is it's done differently in canada than in the states because our our tide tables are based on the distance higher or lower than the mean lowest low whereas in the u.s my understanding is is just the the mean low so so our tides look like they don't get as low as yours do no, I think it's, but it's the just, mean low low. Yeah, I think I, my low, understanding low. is that it's 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 different between us and the US. The actual that our our starting point is a lower one, the lowest low rather than the low low. But anyway, it doesn't matter. It it is all relative and it is all relative for each each place. And I think a lot of people don't don't understand that. Are there maps that show sea level? Over the centuries, you mean? or Well, either over the century, but where is sea level? If mm -hmm. we're calling it, <laughs> you know, it's so abstract that does anybody... I, I think that's also a local thing. 
you know, you have historic data about where where the the high tide is in any given place, and and we see already that that is is changing. It's going up, but it is, you know, it varies from place to place. Because you know, I think people may be thinking that the tides will get bigger, but no, the, they're just coming in higher. <laughs> the tides are because the, the baseline is higher. It's the volume yeah. of water and the impact yeah. the pull has on the increased volume of water. Yeah. That's what it really is. And that right. the baseline is different because the baseline is higher to start, you know, because of that. Yeah. It's it's intrinsically complicated. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, if if I remember right, the Pacific Science Center in Seattle has a model of the Puget Sound, and they have um, um, they're not pumps; they're cylinders to add or take away water um, based on the different factors that affect tide level. And if I remember, it's been a while since I've been there. There's something like 26 different factors that are part of that model. So it's that the biggest one is the gravity of the moon, um, but there's lots of other stuff involved too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, y'all, <clears throat> I'm going to um, wrap things up because I just want to be mindful of people's time and we're about 10 minutes over. <clears throat> and admittedly, people in my house are starting to, uh, <laughs> Little people are starting to fall apart. Um, <laughs> so uh, my dog is in here nudging me like, please help. Yeah. Please help. <laughs> um, anyway, I really wanted to thank you all for joining and especially a big thank you to Bridget and Jesse for their time and their yeah. awesome information. And um, yeah. really, really nice to have you here and part of this community. Um, and if you have any additional questions, you know, feel free to send them um, to our, to our website or to our email address. Um, oh, thanks, Jen. Jen is, uh, giving us lots of data in the, <laughs> in the chat. Um, <clears throat> and so, but if you have follow-up questions, feel free, um, to send it to our name, email, and we can get them to Bridget and Jesse, um, or also just, you can look them up at Washington Sea Grant at, um, and what's the name of your pro coast? I want to get it right. What's the name of your program, Jesse? Oh, Coast Watch. Coast Watch. Okay, I, wanted to, I was on the program earlier with Beach Watch, so I wanted to make sure I got that. Right. Um, anyway, it's really lovely to see all of you, and um, and we hope to see you uh, at our next next uh, Monday evening. Yeah, our next one is more. likely going to be January 9th because January second is really early, um, and we're hoping that Alaska comes through with somebody for that one. Um, mm -hmm. And then Washington um, is presenting again in February, and it looks like it's Brian Footen. Um, with Earth View and 3D mapping of the Puget Sound shoreline. Cool. So that's unconfirmed. So okay. it's confirmed. Keep, keep your eye on our. Oh, it is? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It was so great to see all of your faces. It was great to be here. Yay. Thanks, thank everybody. you, Jesse. Thank great you, Bridget. Job. Happy holidays. Okay. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you.